Welcome to the party. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're glad to have you here. For folks on Facebook, glad you could be with us virtually, digitally. Stand. We're going to, our, our call to worship t- this morning is a little bit different because today is the first Sunday of Advent and we are going to light the candle. From deep in the past, Jeremiah calls us, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Beloved, the days are surely coming when the yearning of the land, the longing of the sun, moon, and stars, the desperate need of the people of earth for the uh, for flourishing and peace will receive their fulfillment. Fear, anxiety, misinformation, and suspicion surround us on every side. We choose to watch and wait in hope, preparing our hearts to notice and cooperate with God's grace already at work in our midst. We light this candle of hope as a sign of our commitment to pay attention and prepare for the days that are surely coming and are already here, the days when God's kingdom of love, justice, and mercy will. And week one, week one is preparations. We're, we're getting prepared. That's what we're doing. Yes. Okay, hold on. Oh, will reign. There's one more word. Will reign. Reign. <laughs> the days when God's kingdom of love, justice, and mercy will reign. All right, let's light. Oh, you lit it. Good. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Let's pray. God, we are grateful to be gathered together once again. It seems strange to say that it is December 1st, but it is. November is gone, Thanksgiving is gone, and we are entering into a brand new season as we look forward to Christmas. And so here we are gathered on the first day of December, the first day of Advent, And some of us come with joy in our hearts. Some of us come with sorrow because the Christmas season is a a source of memories, uh, things that once were, uh, it's tinted with, with sorrow. Some of us come here with frustrations or fears. And yet I hope that all of us can find in this place this morning just a sense of calm, and peace. We say that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and we're going to be talking about peace this morning as we look at the Scriptures, and we long to find that peace right here, if only for an hour. But we pray that you would pour that holy peace upon us as we turn our attention toward you and toward Jesus and the Christmas story and what it all means for us today. Bless us, and we thank you for these gifts and these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So it is Advent, as uh, Chuck just told you, it is four Sundays leading up to Christmas. The the, uh, length of Advent can vary depending on the year, Uh, depends on how many weeks we have. I don't know how that works, but anyway, it's always four Sundays. You always get four Sundays in there. Now sometimes, I'm trying to think if this has happened in my time of ministry, sometimes Sunday, Chuck, have you ever had this where Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Advent is also Christmas Eve or Chris, yeah, which is kind of weird in those years, but this year we get all four Sundays, so it'll be, it'll be nice, but it is a, uh, a time of waiting, Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means arrival or coming, uh, it's got this idea of waiting uh, kind of locked into it. It's a time to prepare our hearts uh, for the for Christmas Day, really, right? When we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we need to be we, our hearts need to be in the right place when that day arrives. Uh, but it's also a time to prepare our hearts for Christians 
it has historically been a time to prepare our hearts and minds for the great day of the Lord. You know what I'm talking about when I say the day of the Lord? Yes. The scriptures talk about the day of the Lord. It's this, this time when uh, Paul says all things will be brought under the rule and reign of Christ. That uh, peace and justice and harmony will be the norm of the day. So we look forward to this day of the Lord. And it seems like God's people have kind of been in a waiting period, really, almost always. Um, Our text today, uh, in Advent, the texts are always from the Old Testament prophets. And you'll see why in just a second. But our, our text today comes from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 33. Uh, let's look at this. Jeremiah says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which Jerusalem will be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. A word from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, let me give you some context of where this was written. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet during, uh, before and during the Babylonian exile. I've talked about that a little bit. There was a point in history in which Babylon came in, wiped out Jerusalem, knocked the temple to the ground, and then forced everybody to go into Babylon as exiles. And there they lived. And so Jeremiah writes this, sends a letter to the exiles in Babylon to give them a sense of hope, that there will come a day in which a righteous ruler will be raised up and he will restore Jerusalem and he will restore your homes and your farms and the temple, and everything will be peaceful and in harmony, and justice will rule. You see this Advent thing kind of built into this automatically? Jeremiah sends this letter and says, I know things are bleak right now, but the days are coming, and it will come. And guess what happened? About 40 years, let's see, he died in, yeah, about 40 years, after Jeremiah wrote that, that's exactly what happened. King Cyrus of Persia made a declaration that all the exiles can go home. They can all go back to their homeland. And he funded, gave them money, and said, go back and rebuild your city walls and rebuild your homes and your farms, rebuild the temple. You can read about that in the book of Nehemiah, how that building project went. King Cyrus... And everything was peaceful for a time. As the city was rebuilt, as life became normal again, as people picked up their old trades and started having babies and grandbabies, it was peaceful for a time. But something was missing because Cyrus was not their king. Cyrus was Persia's king. And so they waited for a ruler who would guide them and protect them, somebody from the line of David. And so they continued to wait, even though things were peaceful, even though Jerusalem was at peace, even though everything had been restored, they waited for that king. And so Persia eventually falls to Greece. Greece is a stronger nation, and they come in and overtake Persia. And then eventually Rome is a stronger nation, and they come and they overtake Greece, and we get to this point at the time of Jesus in which 500 years later, they are still waiting for this peace. We want peace, and we want a ruler who sits on the throne and guides us, and this carpenter's son comes out of Nazareth, and he says some awesome things, and he does some awesome things, And people begin to wonder, maybe, just maybe, this is the guy we've been waiting for. This is the king that Israel has hoped and dreamed and waited for. 
And we believe he was. As Christians, we believe Jesus was that king, just not in the way that folks expected it to turn out. And so Jesus came. Jesus is and was that king from the line of David. But I don't have to tell you, turn on your TV and tell me if Jerusalem is at peace right now. Tell me if that nation, if justice and harmony and peace are ruling right now. They are not. And so we find ourselves 2,000 years later still waiting. We're still waiting for what Jeremiah said to come true. We call that Advent. Advent. I thought about this old song uh, that we used to sing in my church when I was growing up. I grew up Baptist, and so we, we sang hymns, but we also sang what we called choruses. You guys remember those? It was before contemporary music kind of became a thing. People would write these small choruses. There was this one chorus that we would sing. It went something like this. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. I thought about that song, particularly that line, he gave his life, what more could he give? And I started to think, is there really anything that Jesus has withheld from us? You see what I'm saying? What more could he give? He gave his life. He gave all that he had to give. Did he really withhold anything from us? If, if Jesus was telling the truth, if from the cross he said, it is finished, then what are we waiting for? Now, your, your, your immediate answer might be, well, we're waiting for that day in which peace and harmony and justice rule the whole world. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for Jesus to come back and to make that true. John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, he believed strongly, adamantly, that while God's love is all-powerful, has the power to change anything, it is resistible. Meaning, we have a choice. We have a say in the matter. And he believed this strongly because the opposing side said, God is sovereign over everything, even the human heart. That you have no choice in the matter. That if you bow before Jesus, it's because God made you bow before Jesus. And if you don't, it's because God hasn't allowed you to bow before Jesus. God is sovereign over the human heart. And John Wesley looked at that and said, well, if that's true, then the natural conclusion we come to is just to sit around and wait for God to come do what God's going to do. You have no choice in the matter. So we just sit and wait for God to come save the world. And we sit by our fire and we twiddle our thumbs and go, well, we're waiting. We're waiting, God. When are you going to do it? If the world's a mess, it's not because of us. It's because God's in control of all things. And John Wesley said, that doesn't seem right to me. God has given us freedom to choose or reject. That Jesus has saved the world. Jesus came and said, it is finished. I've done all that I can do. I've given all that I can give. All of myself. Now it rests on my followers and on human hearts. That we are invited to give ourselves over to the love of Christ, which has the power to transform our hearts and minds, or we can reject it. But the choice is ours. I'm a Methodist because I think that's true. 
I believe that to be true. And I'm not so sure that that will ever change. Some of us believe that at some point, Jesus is going to come back, and all of a sudden, the MO of God is going to change, and that Jesus will force people to bow and force people to pay homage to him. And that just doesn't seem like the God that I meet in Jesus Christ. That all of a sudden, that God gives humanity freedom to choose or reject, but then all of a sudden comes back and says, that part's over, now I'm in control of your heart, and you will love me, and you will bow before me. That just doesn't seem right. So I ask again, what are we waiting for? What is it that we're waiting for? You know, we're going to be talking about the Christmas story. You know it well. We've got, we've got the nativity scene set up in a couple different places. We know the story of Mary, how she was approached by the angel and said, there's a mission. There, there's something that God wants to do in and through you. And Mary said, chose, may it be so. May what you have just said happen to me and in me and through me. May I deliver the Christ child to the world. We know that story. But Jesus said to his disciples and to us, I am also in you also in you, that you carry the Christ in you, just as Mary did 2,000 years ago. And that the world, whether it knows it or not, is waiting for you to deliver the Christ to the world. Do you see how Mary's story is your story? But you have a choice. You have a choice. And so really, for me, Advent, while it is a waiting period, it's not so much about us sitting around twiddling our thumbs waiting for God to come save the world, because Jeremiah said it's more about the world waiting on God's people to deliver the Christ, to get up and do the things that Jesus told us to do. It's more about God saying, I have done all that I can do. Will you now carry it forward? As my people, in whom I have placed my Holy Spirit, in which the Christ dwells, will you now go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world? That's what Advent is about. (laughs) Because all the kingship of Jesus dwells in you. In fact, Jesus is bold enough to say, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. We just sang a song. The light in which we were waiting for has come into the world. And then Jesus turns to us and says, guess what? You're the light too. Because I am in you and you are in me and we're all in this together. And this is how peace and justice and harmony will come upon the world. When my people in whom I dwell do the things that I told them to do. So I think that Jeremiah is probably true. That there will come a point in which peace and harmony and justice will rule the globe when all things will be placed under the lordship and the reign of Christ. The question is, will that happen in our lifetime because we do the thing? Or will it take many generations later from us because we just didn't want to be the light? We didn't want to be the light. We just wanted to sit around and twiddle our thumbs, or we just wanted to open presents at Christmas time and say, Happy birthday, Jesus, and we just kind of leave it at that. Do you see the weight of this? Do you see the weight of what is on our shoulders right now? I mean, it's a it's a privilege, it's a gift, it's an honor. But it's also a duty and a task and something that we've been called to. And I think, unfortunately, for 2,000 years, probably, 
the church has had this privilege, this gift, or as Paul calls it, this, this uh, treasure in, in clay jars. We have this treasure within us, and we have used it to force other people to bow to Jesus instead of loving people. See, Jesus gave us the blueprint, spent three years with his disciples, and it was written down so that we could see how he lived with his disciples. And the blueprint that he left for us to bring peace and justice in the world looks like this. Love, mercy, forgiveness, sacrifice, compassion, refusing to see others as the enemy. They may see you as the enemy, but don't see them as the enemy. Which is how Jesus is able to say from the cross, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, right? This is what we're called to do. When the world acts opposite of this, this is how those who bear Christ to the world ought to live. Love, mercy, forgiveness, compassion. Advent. Advent. The world is waiting. God is waiting. What will we do with the one who lives in us? Amen. Well, as you guys head out these doors and into a busy week, a busy month of planning and parties and get togethers and Whatever it is that you're going to do, I pray that you would take this blessing with you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May you know that you're perfectly loved, you're completely forgiven, and you're uniquely empowered, filled with the wholeness of Christ. Now you're called to go out of these doors and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. That's a heavy task. And there are going to be moments in which you forget who lives in you, you're going to forget that you're the light of the world. You're going to make some bad choices. You're going to serve yourself. And then you're going to come to and go, what have I done? And I need to know, even in that moment, God doesn't feel any differently about you. God still loves you. God still forgives you. God still embraces with you. And so in light of that, I encourage you to get up and to try again. Every day is a new day to be the light of Jesus and if we do it together, I believe Jesus will come in his fullness and that peace and harmony and justice can rule this globe if we do our small part. So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, take that good word and go from this place in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.